Baptism of the Lord Sunday. Happens every year, the second Sunday of a new year. And if you have a bright and smart and talented preacher, they will preach from one of the gospel lessons where Jesus, his cousin John, you know, baptizes him and Jesus comes up out of the water and each gospel says it a little differently but, you know, the dove and the heavens open up and the dove descends and God's voice said, this is my son. Listen to him or this is whom I'm well pleased. Again, if you have a bright, smart, talented preacher, they will preach that text. This morning, on the baptism of the Lord Sunday, we're going to read from the book of Acts. And so I, I invite you, we're just going to read a few verses there. I invite you, if you have your Bibles, uh, just follow these words. Peter and John, they're having to go out of Jerusalem. And I don't think they're real happy about that. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. The Word of God today for the people of God. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we pray this day that you search us, and that you form us, and that you remind us of who we are as your people, who we are as your church. Remind us, O oh Lord, that you call us to share grace and love and concern and forgiveness. Remind us, Lord, of your unconditional love for us. And now, Lord, may the words of all of our mouths and even the meditations of each one of our hearts May they truly be acceptable in your sight. For you and you alone, Lord, you are our strength and you are our redeemer. Amen. How many of you in life have ever said, well, I've got to go do this or that, and in your mind you know how this or that is going to go? You're 100% sure. If I go into this meeting, I know it's going to turn out that way. But, but sometimes they turn out totally opposite. I, I call those moments God surprises. I, I had one of those surprises the, the, the week in between uh, Christmas and New Year's. You see, our family, we always get away because you're really busy leading up to through Advent and then Christmas and then you stay up all night and then you're, you're ready to get some rest. And so we always go to the beach. We spend four or five days at the beach. That's just what we do. This year, though, Crystal and our son Zach have our grandson and so they decided they were going to get a motel so Eli wouldn't keep any of us up. And that was okay, and so that meant Jamie and myself and Caroline, we would stay in our little place at the beach. Caroline has a boyfriend. I've told you about him, Nick. He's 6'8 or 6'9, and, and so our perfect family week, Caroline came to me and said, Daddy, can Nick go to the beach with us. This is our family week. This boy likes my daughter. He's held her hand. I don't want him at the beach. But this is my little girl. And so I said, sure. 
you know, in my mind, I thought it was going to be a terrible week, and, and it turned out to be a good week. Nick's a, a really interesting guy, a nice guy. He's, he's a senior at UNCC. He's a teaching pro, tennis pro at Providence Racquet Club in Charlotte. Good athlete, and we had a good time. Well, <laughs> you, you see, the other thing that I haven't told you is the way I relax and unwind is Zach and I go play golf. That's just what we do. Caroline again came to me, Daddy. Can Nick go play golf with y'all? She didn't understand. I mean, this is, golf is not a time where we get in touch with our feelings. We go to play golf. I don't even more really want to talk. We go and we play very fast. Now this boy is going to play golf with us. I said, well, Caroline, let me think about it. Of the four days we were there, Zach and I played three days, and then there was the day. I said, Nick, if you'd like to go play golf with me and Zach. And he said, well, I brought my dad's clubs. I, I thought, well, you know, maybe if I tell him we we're going to get up real early, he won't want to go. He'll want to sleep. He's in college. And so I said, Nick, we're going to get up at 6 o'clock. We're going to pick Zach up at 6.30, and we're going to be the first ones on the course. We're teeing off at 7. If that's too early for you, don't worry about it. I'm excited, he says. So that day comes at 6 o'clock. We leave. We pick Zach up at the motel at 6.30. 7 o'clock, we're on the golf course. We're on the first tee. Zach and I walk up. We don't practice swing. We just go up and hit the ball. Then Nick comes, tennis pro. Swings once, misses everything. Swings again, misses everything. Three times he tries to hit that ball on the tee and misses everything. And I look at Zach and I said, this is going to be a long day. <laughs> Knew how this day was going to end up. But you know something? By the third hole, Nick started hitting the ball. By the fourth and fifth hole, Nick was playing golf as fast as Zach and I. By the 14th hole, Nick even parred a hole. And at the end of the day, Zach and I look at each other and we said, you know, we could do this again. Sometimes in our minds, we know how things are going to work out. But, but they turn out totally different. Now, why do we begin there today? Did you notice where Peter and John were sent to. Did you notice the name of that place? Samaria. You see, if you were a Jewish Christian, you, and if you were a Jew, you did not like Samaritans. You did not like the region of Samaria. In fact, you would do everything that you could not to cross through that region. That history was a long history. And part of it was, if you lived in Samaria, you wanted to worship on this mountain. And if you were a true Jew, you worshiped only in Jerusalem. So I just want us to get inside the minds of the apostles when word came to them that Samaria had accepted Christ. Peter and John go. They're the lead apostles. They go, and in their minds they're thinking... Yeah, we're going to go there. We know what we're going to find. <laughs> and then we're going to get out of there as quick as we can. Samaria. Now these same apostles, they'd been with Jesus when he talked about Samaria. You remember when Jesus and the disciples, they stop at noon and the disciples go into town to get something to eat and Jesus is at a well outside of Samaria and a woman comes. And Jesus talks to her and changes her life. That was outside of Samaria. The disciples needed to pay attention. Or you remember that story, that great story that Jesus told. He could tell some good stories of how 
a, a fellow going up from Jericho to Jerusalem to celebrate some holy day falls among robbers. They beat him up and they leave him on the side of the road. And a preacher comes by and walks on the other side and then a teacher comes by, a lawyer, and walks on the other side. Do you remember who helped him? Samaritan. You see, Jesus was teaching these disciples all along, but I'm not sure if they really paid attention. And, and so Peter and John, they go to Samaria and they're thinking in their minds, this is not going to be a good thing. And then they get there and they find out the news. Not only do they believe in Jesus, but some of them have been baptized in the name of Jesus. Some of them have been baptized for repentance of sin. Some of them were probably baptized by John. And, and so when Peter and, and John get there, they pray that the Holy Spirit might come upon all of these people. This isn't turning out the way that they thought that it would. And they don't rebaptize them. But did you notice what Luke, the writer of Acts, says? They laid their hands on them. And then the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit. You see, for Peter and John and for the rest of the apostles, this wasn't the way they envisioned this mission journey. But I love the idea that they laid their hands on them. There's power in the touch. I, I want you to think of, uh, of your life and, and remember those times in your life when just the touch of somebody else made you feel comfortable, filled you with grace. I've shared with you before, but Many years ago, my father was diagnosed with colon cancer when we were serving the church in Morganton. And you know what that church did? They called all of my preacher family together, and we knelt at an altar at North Morganton United Methodist Church, and people in Burke County came and they laid their hands on us and prayed for my father. There's power. 1993, I stood at an altar in Lexington, North Carolina, and I'm looking across the aisle from or, or, or across the way there, and I hold hands with this girl named Jamie Cartner, and my dad and her dad put their hands on our hands, and they said, we're going to bless this marriage. There's power in the touch. In 1988, I knelt at an altar at Stewart Auditorium, at Lake Junaluska, and a bishop laid his hands on my head and said, Take thou the authority to preach and to teach God's word. There's power in the touch. I'll never forget as long as I live last Sunday here when Erica, remember Erica, is going to be a missionary in the Middle East. When we in this sanctuary held hands, there's power in the touch. Peter and John, they go and God spoke to them, the Holy Spirit spoke to them to lay hands on them because there was power in that touch. You didn't know Elizabeth, but she was a member of mine for six years. 54 years old, she was diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer. She had adult children. But, but her main concern was not herself. Her, her main concern was her children because even though they were adults, none of them were married and she always just wanted to see them married. Life wasn't going to allow her to do that. Her church surrounded her. Her church prayed for her. Toward the end of her life, she was in and out of the hospital, and, and everybody would go visit Elizabeth. She was just such a pleasant lady. One day I was visiting her. I visit early in the hospital. And so I'm there early, and she's asleep. 
And so I do what I do. I'm just writing her a note, telling her I'll see her. And I go to lay that note on that table beside me. I said, Elizabeth, you're dreaming. I'm not here. Go back to sleep. We love you and we're praying for you. She said, yeah, I didn't rest well last night. I said, well, you just go back to sleep. She said, could, could you sit just for a moment and just hold my hand? Yeah. You don't have to say anything, Paul. Just, just hold my hand. She drifted off to sleep, and then she woke up, and she said, I'm, I'm so sorry you got stuck here holding my hand. I said, boy, that fills me with confidence. She said, no, nah, it's just nice to be touched. You see, people come in here, and they touch me but they draw blood or they get my blood pressure or they touch me by listening to my heart and my lungs I just need somebody to touch me at her funeral I said those words that we often say as in baptism Elizabeth put on Christ so in death May she be clothed in Christ. There's something about a touch. You know, as I prayed through this scripture this week, I realized something. The water of baptism. Water. You know what that really is? It's the touch of God. 